Um, hello, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, year's first edition of a feminist exploration organized by the members of the European Feminist Platform. My name is Neil Data. I'm the executive director of the European Parliamentary Forum for Sexual and Reproductive Rights. Um, and we're here going to be discussing Poland uh, today. So first, uh, a few words about the European Feminist Platform. It is a network in the making, combining the work of feminist scholars, activists, and advocates to collectively fight against the backlash from the far right and to create a strong bond of feminist solidarity all over Europe and beyond. You can find out more about the European Feminist Platform in the link that we will post in the chat room. So we're here to, uh, we're happy to host this event with the support of the Heinrich Böll Foundation European Union and the Gunter Werner Institute. Please note that this event will be recorded and you will be able to watch all editions of this, of this series on the YouTube channel of the Heinrich Böll uh, Foundation. This is going to be a moderated discussion, so please feel free to submit any questions through the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, um, and we will then discuss them after the input that we will hear shortly. Uh, in today's session, we will shed light on the situation in Poland regarding sexual and reproductive health and rights, as well as democracy and the rule of law, with a specific focus on the consequences of the Constitutional Tribunal's decision to ban abortion in cases of fetal anomaly of October 2020. Together with Elisa uh, Rutinowska, we will explore the impact of the verdict of, uh, on Polish women's access to legal abortion, the reaction from Polish civil society and the general public to the Polish authorities' repressive actions in the face of public cont contestation. We're very glad to welcome our, our colleague, um, Eliza Rutinowska. She is a pro bono lawyer for many uh, pro women's rights and democracy demonstrators and will, re and will explain to us how this court fits in with the wider puzzle of the degradation of uh, democracy and rule of law in Poland. So without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to you, Eliza, to take us through the, the events, the complicated and disturbing events happening in Poland. Eliza, please. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, and welcome everyone who has decided to spend this afternoon with us. Um, I feel honored to be able to speak to you today, um, even though through Zoom. But on the other hand, I'm quite happy because that means that many more people can join us um, rather than if we were meeting at some cafe or other, um, or, or other place. So I'm very happy to be here with all of you today. I'm less happy about what is going on uh, in my country, and I am not at all very happy about what I will be um, explaining to you today. Um, I wanted to start with really getting you into the atmosphere of Poland today. For the longest time, Poland was seen as a, um, you know, a winning horse of this race towards democracy, towards improving human rights. Um, after it's uh, after joining the EU, uh, it really you know uh, the, the it sped up with its um, modern modernization and really became a European state. We started seeing each other more as Europeans rather than only just Poles, and then. 2015 hit. It was real to me personally, it was really the first moment when I really realized what politics was about and what everybody says uh, when everybody says that if you're not interested in politics, politics sooner or later will become interested in you. Um, that's when Law and Justice, a uh, conservative populistic party uh, gained power. Of course, we can always say that, you know, that's the essence of democracy. Sometimes the liberals win, sometimes, uh, you know, the conservatives win. That's the deal. But democracy, in uh, our view, in the view that we are used to as persons who understand human rights, um, is meant to mean that it is a ruling of the majority with respect towards minorities. That's the essence of democracy today, of modern democracy, what it should be about. Now, what happened in Poland was completely different. What we were witnessing was a gradual overtaking 
of institution after institution of the prosecutor's office, an attempt to completely overtake common courts, and uh, uh, which is partially failed, fortunately, because of our common court judges who are still independent. However, the ruling party managed to change and uh, amend the laws so that the constitutional court was overtaken and is now politically controlled. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, is also so-called overtaken and an additional chamber was added called the disciplinary chamber, which was meant to discipline uh, judges, prosecutors, and other lawyers. All of this is to show what it means when a populists, not conservatives, populists take over power. Um, but the first thing that they did was overtake the public media. That was their propaganda tube, which is being used uh, very openly till this day. This is all to say, to show you the background of the situation and the seriousnesses and the seriousness of it. So all in all, let's speed forward to last year when the pandemic hit. Now, once you have a democracy, a functioning democracy, where all the checks and balances are in place, you can be sure, or at least more sure, that once a crisis hits, the government will be going, will be taking uh, precautions in accordance to certain set rules. You can be quite sure that it will follow the constitutionally discussed order and, for example, introduce a state of emergency. Now, unfortunately, we entered the pandemic with a populist government. What does that mean for human rights? Of course, everybody in the world was affected by the pandemic and everyone had to see somehow their freedoms limited, be it cafes closing down, be it a, a limitation of gatherings. But again, you can ask, what is the legal basis of those cafes being closed down and the gatherings being limited? What happened in Poland was completely different. Without the introduction of state of emergency, which would allow the government constitutionally to limit certain uh, freedoms and liberties, the government started to act by introducing regulations. Now regulations within the Polish legal system are the lowest, lowest ranking legal acts just above local laws. And using those regulations, the government decided to completely limit freedom of assembly, to close down specific areas of the economy, and what we ended up with was limitations of our freedoms without a legal basis for that. Of course, that was the take of the lawyers, but that was not the take of the police, nor the prosecutor's office. Why is all of this relevant to women's rights, you may ask? Because once a court decision, I will not call it a judgment due to several formal aspects of it um, being quite, well, um, controversial in terms of legal terms. For example, one of the judges that uh, was behind the ruling on the abortion issue was one of the uh, MPs who signed the initial motion that she later um, considered as a constitutional tribunal judge. Um, so that was the, that's the, that's the very first basis on which she should not have been one of the judges to, um, to be behind the, the decision. So once that decision was issued, people took to the streets, but due to the regulations that were put in place, the police decided that all of these assemblies were illegal. And what did the overtaken public TV say? that all of those who were participating in these gatherings were there illegally. Moreover, they were spreading disease. 
So not only were protesters for women's rights, um, you know, called out for their uh, feministic views or uh, called baby killers or all of the other um, names that they're used to being called. Right now, they were also being that they were be being put on public trial, so to speak, for spreading a disease that everybody was suffering from. So that really shows you that we were not only combating, we were not only fighting as lawyers for the rights of the protesters, we were not only fighting for women's rights regarding that decision that was passed by the tribunal, we were also combating this narrative that was very widely distributed, not only by the ruling party, but also by the public television and everybody um, who was close to power. Now, all of this, again, is to show you the atmosphere in which we were placed after the October ruling of 2020. What else happened? Um, women were, a, or women's bodies, were a battlefield a long time before this decision took place. As you may have heard, um, one of the first decisions of this government was to restrict the, um, after, the morning after pill um, for it to be distributed only after a prescription was issued by a doctor. Now, women in Poland, um, more and uh, the uh, majority of women in Poland have a problem getting to a gynecologist, um, a public gynecologist, to obtain uh, even a regular health service, let alone find one uh, quickly enough to, in order to obtain a prescription um, for the morning after pill. Now, due to what the government did, that became almost impossible for women to obtain the morning after pill, not only due to the lack of the, the uh, gynecologists, but also due to the fact that many of them have signed the so-called conscious clause, which meant that they can refrain from uh, giving out a prescription for emergency contraception or performing um, uh, abortions, for example. Of course, this was questioned by lawyers. Um, lawyers wanted to limit that conscientious clause solely to the practice of abortion. However, again, this takes time, which Polish women didn't have. The next step of limiting women's rights was also an attack on sexual education in schools. Now this, this attack is continuing till this day um, and numerous, uh, ministers of education are uh, very adamant in saying that they will not let in sexual educators into schools, into high schools, or into any other educational institutions that are under the state's control. For a while, the subject quietened down, and then the first abortion draft bills hit. One of them, of course, uh, claimed that the woman should also be punished for obtaining an abortion. Another uh, said a complete ban on abortion should be put in place. Um, all of them were debated, all of them pr were protested against, and that's when the umbrella strikes started, the so-called umbrella strikes, because most of them took place in the rain, so most of the photographs that you may see from those strikes will be women carrying uh, umbrellas, and that's why they were called the umbrella strikes, and that's why the umbrella became the symbol for the women's strike. Again, the government took a step backwards. There were so many women on the streets. Um, uh, there was a, even a strike that was, um, was, was similar to the one done in Iceland years ago, um, which meant that women decided not to go to work for one day. And this quietened down the topic again. Fast forward to 2020, when you have the pandemic, when you have everyone locked up in their houses, when you have the narrative that if you are going outside gathering, you are spreading the disease, when you have the regulations that are put in place, and even though they're unconstitutional and illegal, they are being executed by the police. And then you have a judgment or a decision uh, being issued 
that is basically banning 97% of all performed abortions. That really shows you and highlights that this is not a ban on abortion due to fetus abnormality. This is effectively a total ban on abortion in Poland. Now, people of course took to the streets, regardless of what the public television said of, uh, of whether or not they could have been detained by the police. But no one, no one was prepared for what they have what they decided to do and how they decided to address these protests. Again, we still believe that they would not use brute force. They did use brute force. We thought Ketling methods, they're not gonna use Ketling methods, especially in, in a pandemic. They're not gonna crowd people together and not let them leave. They did. They're not gonna use batons. They're not gonna go after you know, uh, innocent women armed with, with, with what cards and, and cardboards and, 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 and words of human rights. They did. They were not going to detain anybody, right? I mean, we were only ex exercising our right to freedom of assembly. They're not gonna go after us for that. They did. They not only went after uh, multiple people, multiple peaceful protesters, they not only detained them, they not only put them in police cars, they also drove them out from the city to the outskirts. And I'm not talking about two kilometers, three kilometers, 10 kilometers. I'm not even talking about 20 kilometers. I'm talking about 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers from the city center. Now imagine, being driven out from a peaceful gathering from the center of the major, the, the biggest uh, city in, in your country, 50 kilometers outside and then left in a police precinct for the night or even worse, being driven out 30 kilometers and then let out at 3 a.m. in the morning with no way to get back home. That's the reality that we are facing right now in Poland. Now, this is not the end. We are still fighting. We are still on the streets. Um, lawyers, multiple pro bono lawyers, are uh, having are taking the backs of the uh, protesters, and we are still at a war with the narrative of what we are truly fighting for. The narrative issue is an extremely important aspect of the fight for human rights. What we have been witnessing for the past six years is a redefining, an attempt to redefine human rights. What we felt were values that were completely, that, that were already decided. We knew what freedom was. We knew what dignity was. Suddenly, we don't. Suddenly, there's somebody who's telling us that you don't know what dignity is. That dignity does not apply to a pregnant woman. It applies to a fetus. And how will you argue with that? You're not prepared to argue with that because you have a completely different concept of the word dignity. Now, you're going to be going after the EU charter, for example, fundamental rights. You're going to reach for the European Convention of, for Human Rights. And they're gonna tell you this, are you a Pole? If you're a Pole, you should be interpreting the Polish law. You should not be reaching out to foreign laws. That is what you would hear. Any sort of attempt to show an international standard, a European standard is going to be bombarded for being an attempt to introduce foreign and enemy ideals and values into our system. You are going to be placed in the same group of people who are attacking the tradition and people who are attacking a family. Now you don't want to attack either your country's tradition or, uh, or families for that matter, but that doesn't matter because you're going to be 
an actor in that play that is being directed by somebody, somebody else. So this really shows you that what we should be really talking about as human rights defenders is how do we protect the already decided definitions of human rights? How do we show that they have not gone out of style, that they, have, that they do not need to be redefined in any way? They should be protected and they should be guarded. They should not be changed. Now, again, this is a very difficult discussion um, however, it's one that we have been forced into by circumstances. And of course, the abortion issue is not a topic that should be discussed in the middle of the pandemic. But this is the moment, which is the best moment for populists to do so. Again, the pandemic lets them say, that we are doing specific, we're introducing specific measures, we're introducing specific regulations for your own good. We're introducing the limitations of freedom of assembly so that people do not um, spread the disease in bigger groups. However, the churches are, are still open. There is no worry there. So this also shows you another thing that we have been witnessing, a, du a dichotomy, a duality of legal, of, of, of legal consciousness, of, of, um, of different legal worlds that we are right now a part of. We have European courts, and that, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to include both the ECJ and the ECHR, the European Court of Justice and the uh, European Court for Human Rights. We're talking about our common courts, who, which are standing up for citizens' rights and applying the constitution directly in specific cases. And then we have the courts that have been overtaken, the constitutional court and the Supreme Court now, and the prosecutor's office as well. Now, these are two worlds that are coexisting or are attempting to coexist, but have been created. So to create legal chaos, within which really citizens are lost. They don't know what's going to happen. Now, for the longest time, they could have reached out to the Ombudsman's office. And the Ombudsman's office was an institution, an independent institution, which, would, which is what's called for by the constitution in order to protect our human rights and liberties. Now, what happened today? The Constitutional Court decided that it is contrary to the Constitution for the current Ombudsman to continue his function after his term ended, even if there is no um, a new Ombudsman chosen. Now, what does that mean? That means that Adam Bodnar, our Ombudsman, ended his term in September of last year the ruling coalition did not manage to support any uh, candidate that would have a chance to be also accepted by the Senate because the candidate for the Polish Ombudsman has to be accepted by both the lower chamber and the higher chamber of our parliament. And they refused to support a candidate of the opposition, which meant an independent candidate. So what they decided to do was to remove the current ombudsman who was an independent ombudsman from office in order, and that is our anticipation as lawyers, to introduce a position of a so-called acting ombudsman. Now, what does that mean? We are anticipating that this means they will be attempting to amend the law on the ombudsman to introduce a political nominee. Now, if we were set in a courtroom, you would expect to have a defender by your side. Now imagine that the prosecutor sitting across from you decides that, you don't, that he doesn't want you to have a defender or he wants you to have a defender that he is choosing. That's exactly what's happening to the Polish nation. We have lost our human rights defender 
and we have no idea who's going to be taking his place or if somebody will be taking his place. Now the human rights defender is more than just an empty word or an institution that is not close to the people. I will tell you from practical experience what it means to have the ombudsman interested in what you're doing. When I was at a police station at 2 a.m. in the morning with terrified uh, people who got detained, we had uh, a representative of the uh, National Mechanism for the Prevention of Torture, a body which works within the ombudsman's office. And that representative arrived and that representative actually spoke to those who were detained. And then that national, that body, the National Prevention for the, the, for the National Mechanism for the Prevention of Torture issued a report of all abuses of power done by the police, committed by the police. So that's how the ombudsman is present in our everyday lives. And that's what going, that is what's going to be missing very soon. Now, to end my uh, speech, I would like to show you a photograph of what I'm talking about and something that that photograph really speaks volumes of what the last year has been. Now, the person you can see in purple is me at the back and the person in front of me is Grandma Catherine Babchakasha one of our biggest heroes of the recent months. Uh, a retired person who was extremely active in being at every single more imp uh, important and less important as well, human rights protest. Now, she has been accused multiple times of assaulting a police officer with that rainbow canvas bag that you can see um, on the in the photograph. I will end here and pass the floor over back to Neil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elisa. That was really excellent. I think you've shown us uh, all about how um, what's happening in Poland is not just about women's rights or, or abortion rights even, that, it's, that that is really the, the entry point for a whole unraveling of democracy and, and the rule of law in the country. And um, so I think it's, it, it's really great that you were able to place it in such a much wider perspective. And, uh, and it, opens up the, it opens up the possibility to understand, for, for those of us to understand the gravity of what's happening in, in, in your country. Um, now, we don't have that many questions yet, so I'd invite all of you to, who have questions to formulate them in the Q&A because that's the only way of, uh, that we can interact on this webinar. So please uh, take a few minutes and, and ask a few questions. But I have some questions myself, and also we do have one in there, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll abuse my rights as a moderator to ask my question first. Um, and I, I, I was wondering, based on what you've just described here, Elisa, um, I was wondering if you could say a, a few words about what you think the reaction from the EU has been like, um, because as you know, there have been resolutions adopted by the European Parliament, so there's political support at that level. Um, there's rule of law infringement procedures that have started against uh, Poland by the, by the European Commission. Those have only gotten to a certain, those have only gone so far. So, I mean, based on what you've just said, what do you think would be useful or possible from the EU level to, to help unravel the situation that you've described in Poland, where, um, where really, as, as you pointed out, we're, you're living in, um, in a duality of two different legal orders. One, what is, what's emerging in, in your country, which is very different from the, e, from the European legal order, which should in, in fact encompass Poland as well. And yeah, and we're getting questions in. So take a few minutes to answer that and then we'll get to other questions. Well, there's, I'd like to answer that with two points. Um, firstly, the positive point and then the uh, less, less optimistic one. Um, so beginning with the, with the good news. Um, the EU has been absolutely phenomenal in giving us a platform in being a voice for those that are being silenced within their own country. 
it has stood up for us. It has stood up for human rights. It has flagged numerously the abuses of power, the abuses of human rights in Poland. And for that, we will owe a great thank you. And of course, uh, we do expect and we do hope that the EU will not leave us alone um, and will continue to flag these abuses of power. It is extremely important that Poland was and continues to be on the agenda. It is extremely important that, our, that the Polish representatives or the representatives of the Polish government are being questioned, that they are not left alone to do uh, their, their will, that, the, that their actions are being questioned on the international, in the, on the international arena. That being said, I feel like we do have a big problem coming up with even if we will get judgments that we hope for, or even if the certain procedures that were launched will be, uh, will be pushed forward, will they be respected by the Polish government? That is the biggest question. Because interim measures that have been put in place by the ECJ concerning the disciplinary chamber have not been respected, are not being respected. And nothing is being done about it. So looking at that from that perspective, one thing is what the EU can do and is doing. And the other thing is, and a completely other thing is whether there will be some consequences to it, whether uh, the Polish government will comply with anything. I'll give you an example. It's not only the EU that is standing up, it's also the UN, of course. When we had the Universal Periodic Review back a couple of years back, where there was a recommendation put forward for Poland to broaden the scope of its hate crime laws, the government decided to accept the recommendation. And then when it came back home, so to speak, it openly said that it was not willing to do anything about it. So what did the government do? I'll leave that for you, for everyone to answer that question for themselves. But if I were asked, I would say that was just a blunt lie. So what can the EU do for the government to respect what it's doing? That's the biggest question we're facing today. Okay, very good. Thank you, Lisa. And we've had quite a few questions coming in about what can be done at EU level. And maybe in relation to this, you didn't touch upon this, but um, but it's been in the media and, and it may be good just to have your opinion, although I realize it could, it's probably out of your zone of, of your field of expertise. But for example, there's been discussions about um, about tying funding coming from the EU to Poland to respect of rule of law. And, um, and I think it's last year. Norway decided to suspend its funding to Poland via the European Economic Area Instrument uh, because of concerns of rule of law. Do you think that's something worthwhile exploring? Definitely. Um, we are actually uh, having this discussion right now uh, regarding the uh, COVID, uh, the, the COVID recovery fund um, that is that, that was uh, you know put in place last year, and is awaiting ratification. Um, in, in, in member states and in Poland. And the thing is that we're not, so all in all, it's a wonderful idea. And if we were a truly democratic state, we would be very happy for our government to receive those funds. However, we are a para-democratic state at the moment. And once those funds will reach the Polish government, solely the Polish government without, for example, including um, local governments as well, we fear that those funds that are meant to upkeep our democracy will be used to basically destroy it even further from the inside out. So um, definitely linking funds to respecting specific rules that is, the, that, that is the way to go. I mean, if you join a football club, you're not going to get a scholarship if you start drinking. Those are the rules. And if you enter a specific club, you have to follow the rules. And that club has to have the possibility to reinforce those rules. 
-hmm. And that's not taking away the independence of a state if it willingly um, became a member of that club. So definitely, but that, but those mechanisms also have to go hand in hand with a specific narrative because it will be really easy for the populace to overtake that narrative and show it as a way that see the EU is punishing the Poles. Now it's not punishing the Poles. It should punish the Polish government. That there's a difference. Okay, thank you very much. We've gotten a, quite a few questions in, so I'll try, I won't go through them in order. I'm trying to organize them mentally so, so that we can have um, a, a, a logical sequence. Uh, one that comes up that I think would be important to address is if you could say something about the situation regarding the Istanbul Convention. And uh, what, and, and specific, uh, since I know a little bit about this, if you could say a little bit where the Istanbul Convention specifically stands. And then also that, as you know, that's only 50% of the equation what is the document that they have in the in in the sidelines to replace the Istanbul Convention? So, if you could say a few words about that. Right. Yeah. So um, they're not very open about what document they have. Uh, you know, cooking up. Um, we are, of course, as human rights lawyers, we're monitoring all of the ideas that are popping up over uh, on the internet. It's different foundations that are working on different documents, um, and we are anticipating that the uh, Family Rights Convention is the one that will be um, used as the alternative to the Istanbul Convention. But to put this in, 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 in more uh, cohesive um, order. So if there is a draft bill in parliament, which um, gives the right to, or gives the okay sign for Poland to withdraw from the Istanbul Convention. Now, it also highlights that the Istanbul Convention should be replaced by a uh, document uh, uh, that is of course, uh, that complies with family values and, 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 and so on and so on and traditional values, all of these values that have been flagged as uh, those that are being not being respected by the Istanbul Convention. So um, we feel like there is a document. We're we don't have an official stand on which document it will be, um, but there, it, it is being flagged that there is one um, in the making. So uh, what I'm anticipating is um, an idea to actually reach out to other countries that are also not that friendly with the uh, Istanbul Convention or have doubts uh, regarding the, the Istanbul Convention. So, you know, we might one day wake up in a, in a reality where we have two Istanbul Conventions because, you know, once Turkey now withdrew from the Istanbul Convention, I mean, there's nothing uh, stopping Warsaw uh, from reaching out to Turkey again and, you know, creating an Istanbul Convention to zero. Yeah, and I think, thank you for that, Elisa. And I think also maybe just to point out that in relation to Turkey, what we're hearing uh, about the Erdogan's uh, um, uh, um, announcement to withdraw from the Istanbul Convention, that that announcement may itself have been illegal. Uh, according to the Turkish constitutional order, uh, the executive should not have the power to make such a decision, which was Turkey ratified the Istanbul Convention unanimously through parliament. And so, so it's interesting that two anti-women's rights initiatives, such as your constitutional tribunal's decision and Turkey's uh, Istanbul con uh, uh, Convention withdrawal could both be technically illegal. So it's rather, it's an interesting fact. Um, and, and also maybe to point out that this Family Rights Convention, isn't it largely inspired by what has been called the LGBT free zones in uh, by the European Parliament? Yeah, uh, so it's sort of a mix of ideas. So there's um, the attack on human rights is a very broad attack. It, it uses the same words, it uses the same ideas, it uses the same uh, phrases even. If you take a look at the declarations, you always have the same phrases repeated over and over again, you know, family, traditions, fa traditional family uh, for the protection. Once you take, you know, uh, uh, a search kind of box and then type in the specific phrases, they're gonna be repeated over and over again. So yes, these documents have a tendency to mirror themselves. Could you say a little bit about who are the engineers behind a lot of this thinking in Poland? Because it doesn't come out of, uh, come out of a vacuum. If you could say a few words about who's crafting these documents, who's contributing to the courts and, 
and um, and uh, um, and to the thinking of the of the ruling party. I think there are a lot of actors. Um, those more visible, though less those who are less visible. Um, well, firstly, I unfortunately, with a heavy heart, have to uh, co-see that the Catholic, the Polish Catholic Church is very active um, in terms of uh, flagging uh, specific topics that should be understood in a specific way by, um, by believers or by parishers. Um, churches have, unfortunately, become a, uh, a political battleground as well and a political arena so there's the, that's one actor that uh, that I need to name. The second actor being um, these kind of pop up NGOs. That's what we call them. So at the beginning of the ruling of the, of the rule of law and justice or peace government, um, what we have seen is another alternative world coming up of of alternative NGOs. Now, what do these alternative NGOs really mean? is that they have the same ideas that the ruling party has or the, 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 the authorities have. So they're not watchdog organizations as NGOs should be. They are more of a lobbyist group, I would say, behind a facade of being an NGO. Now calling yourself an NGO does not make you one. Um, and that's, that's, that's the biggest worry that we have as other NGOs and think tanks, um, because, you know, th they often submit shadow reports even, and to and those shadow reports reach serious international organizations. And when these organizations look at them, I mean, you know, they're, it's, it's an NGO document. We should also consider it. So, um, that's the second group of actors. And then, of course, there's the third group of actors, political, political activists. Um, and those are, but that's the smallest group, I would say. I think that the two main ones are the biggest, um, are the biggest ones that we have to see. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And maybe sticking with the biggest actor that you mentioned, the Polish Catholic Church, um, could you say a little bit, this is a question we received from Alison Turner, about why has the church in Poland retained its influence when so many people in other countries have rejected the church for a variety of reasons, including the child abuse cover-ups? And we know that there's been also, like in every country, um, uh, there's been a big pedophilia scandal in Poland uh, that re that was that's really quite recent. Um, uh, so if you could say a few words about this and how how did this play out in Poland? Yes, uh, it's it's quite difficult to really um, explain it quickly. Um, but the position of the Polish Catholic Church has been extremely strong for a couple of hundred years due to our history as well. So Poland has been under the rule of different empires for a very long time, and it has fought a lot of wars. Um, and during that time, the church was always seen as a place of refuge for uh, many of our, you know, the war heroes, the, the political activists. Uh, also during the uh, communist era, that was the place where, where, where the activists would go. Uh, then there was the, uh, the you know, the, the support of the Polish Pope during the transition, transi transitional time of the 80s and the 90s. Um, all of this contributed to the power the church has over um, the Polish society. Now, it's not something that will change very quickly. Um, and, you know, again, over 70% to 80% of Poles declare themselves as practicing Catholics. The numbers are going down significantly from what it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But again, there is a difficulty in separating the church as it was seen for hundreds of years to what to how it is acting today. But if I were to um, you know predict the future or attempt to predict the future, if the church does not back out from this this you know way of acting on the political scene and this uh, ingration and then this and this um, attempt at controlling human rights and freedoms it will lose. 
Okay, thank you. We have a few more questions that it's, it would be good if we can get through. So I have one from uh, Andrea Petto, who is saying that, um, who is questioning a little bit the way you described it at the beginning, saying that the, um, that the populists uh, sort of came out of nowhere and uh, that they probably have a, a longer track record. And, I was, and uh, the question is, in, in what sense does this type of interpretation limit the, the understanding uh, of this, what is a global phenomenon, and also possible ways to uh, develop counter strategies uh, for this? That's a great question. Um, of course, they didn't come out of nowhere. They just gained the, you know, the, a huge following very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, president that we have now on, on his second term, uh, President uh, Duda, uh, was a man from nowhere, really. He wasn't known. He wasn't widely known. He was completely created by that one presidential campaign. Now that's something that you have to understand. It, it, it re the, the populists didn't come out of nowhere, but they were not the ones who were uh, the faces of 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 who was you know of, of the of the presidential elections and then of the of the um, uh, pre parliamentary elections. Um, they were they were they decided to go for new faces. That was the the biggest surprise. Um, however, they did not come out of nowhere. In Poland, um, I believe they came out of a very tragic situation, um, the Smolensk catastrophe. Um, so it was a, an airplane crash where 96 people were killed, uh, including uh, our former president, his wife, and multiple MPs, and uh, members, uh, and, other, and other very public figures. And on that, uh, the leader of the, governing, of the current governing party built his narrative. And it took him many years to build that narrative. It took him, you know, a significant amount of time, five years really, to um, gain political, you know, power again. First, it was just empathy or sympathy from, you know, the voters because he lost his twin brother. And then he started to question whether it was a, 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 a really an airplane crash or whether it was an attempt, uh, an, uh, an, a terrorist attack. Um, he never said who did it, but you know, it was always there. It was always this, uh, and now it is openly being said that, you know, Russians had something to do with it. And of course, if Russians, you know, the biggest enemies of Poland, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera that's what really drew many people into his cult, so to speak. Now I'm calling this a cult because he uh, created these marches that marched every 10th of every month and that's how the movement grew. This movement of anti-democracy, of you know, uh, questioning everything that the former government did um, and seeing it as, as an enemy of the true Poles. So that, that kind of attempt at using empathy grew into nationalism and nationalism grew into populism with a hint of nationalism. So of course they didn't come out of nowhere, but again, uh, this kind of shows you shows, shows you how it grows. Now, how to counter it? I would say don't feed into a narrative. Don't feed into a narrative that is extremely dangerous. That, that is why I'm, I'm continuing to kind of highlight that we need to stop this narrative of redefining human rights. We have to stand up for what they truly mean. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I think that was very, I think you've explained that very well, where on the one hand, they did appear suddenly in 2015 when they acceded to power, a bit like what Trump did in 20, when he was elected in 2016. But the antecedents which made that happen are go back much, much further. And I think perhaps what was a surprise is to many democratic minded people is that these people could be taken seriously and that they would actually gain power and that once they do gain power, then um, then the, that the agenda would be so damaging that would that they would not conform to certain of the norms that the, that are expected of democratic governance. 
But uh, we have a few more questions. One is um, about the role of Polish civil society in all of this. This is, uh, I think you know very well about that. So it would be great if we could hear a little bit from you about, um, about Polish civil society, the women's strike, the other NGOs and how they've been organizing. Right, um, thank you for that question. It's, it's really close to my heart. Um, I, before I became a lawyer for the Civil Development Forum, I was a lawyer uh, at the Polish Society of Anti-Discrimination Law. So an NGO which really tackles um, the, one of the most difficult areas of human rights, protection, discrimination, fight, the fight against discrimination. And really the Polish NGOs, the true Polish NGOs have, uh, had an accelerated course at uh, a, a coalition building. So what happened was um, whenever a new idea came up that was attacking human rights, that was especially bluntly against human rights and human rights standard, many, many NGOs decided to come together and, and create different coalitions. Now, just to give you an example, we have the Committee for the Defense of, uh, of Justice. And that committee, uh, you know, created by different NGOs, which tackled the idea of, and, and which fight for the idea of the rule of law against disciplinary proceedings for independent judges, against the disciplinary proceedings for uh, prosecutors. Uh, they're present, they're ever present at every single hearing of a disciplinary hearing. Um, that's the biggest value that the Polish civil society brings into the game, uh, their presence. Same goes for women's strike. Um, the women's strike was uh, extremely amazing in another sense as well. It activated so many different women all over the country. We had small towns where only one, where, where it was so well known that even one woman uh, decided to show up for, uh, for uh, a protest. And that is saying something in a small conservative town in the middle of you know, uh, Southern Poland, for example. Now, uh, that was not there before, you know, that kind of courage that the civil society brought into play, uh, it, was, it, it is quite amazing to see. Okay, great, thank you. That's very inspiring, Lisa, thank you. Um, we're near the end of our session, but uh, there's still a few more questions to, that would be great if you could address. Um, one of them, very briefly, um, it's, perhaps a, not, it's perhaps a bit of a complex question to raise near the end, but if there's, a, there's one here about um, if there's any flaws in the Polish legal system or constitution that allowed the, the, uh, the PIS government to uh, to capture the courts so so quickly, and um, and then on the one hand, so the flaws with any potential flaws on the Polish uh, judicial system, and then separately, if you have any thoughts on the on the possible strategies that we should be following at EU level or Council of Europe level in order to help the situation in in Poland. It's a great question that I have been asking myself for the past six years um, and trying to find those, those flaws. Um, but in all seriousness, there's this Latin saying that um, all laws fall silent when the uh, arms raise up. Uh, arms me meaning uh, you know, guns and, and swords and, and what have you not. Um, and unfortunately, that's what happened here. Uh, to put it bluntly, uh, we are lawyers with our laws, with our provisions, with our written constitution. And on the other hand, we have a baseball bat that is basically, uh, you know, swiping everybody out of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the picture. Um, of course, you can say that, you know, the constitution was not as, as uh, precise as it should have been, but that's the meaning of the constitution. A constitution cannot be precise to the point because it has to give a realm of, of possibilities for uh, the changing of times. You know, the constitution stays very, very stable and it, and it ensures the stability of, of the state. However, laws have to be sometimes changed, but the constitution does give specific conditions such as Poland is a democratic state of law. And under that, there is an entire, you know, world of, of, of what it means to be a democratic state of law. There is article seven, which, which says explicitly that our uh, authorities have to act within the written boundaries, within, within the written provisions. And they have broken those laws. They have broken those regulations. They have broken these uh, rules 
that have been put in place by the Constitution. So the Constitution cannot be, you know, 3,000 pages long, including every single possible scenario that can come up. But it does have specific rules that the government has to follow. Now, um, what can be done to protect us? Of course, we have been as lawyers um, looking at different possibilities to improve the checks and balances approach of specific um, you know, provisions at least. But again, all the legal acts that we can put in place can be changed by different legal acts. So um, unless you know, the governing uh, powers decide to, co to um, you know, comply with the constitution, we will always be at the losing end because again, laws force silent in the face of arms. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and instead of the wrapping up, because I don't think I can do justice to what you've very elegantly uh, expressed today, uh, maybe the best way of wrapping up now would be to address one of the qu two questions that we've received, which are specifically maybe to hear you from you parting words about um, uh, that you can communicate to the over 80 people that have joined uh, this uh, webinar today. Um, uh, who all want to help in some way about what's happening in Poland. So what would you, what would your, what would be your suggestions for what the international community can do? And also specifically, what can, what, what role can feminists play in helping the situation in Poland? Thank you uh, for that question. Um, firstly, I would uh, see it similarly to how I see what the EU can do. Uh, continue to give a platform and to raise voices of those who are falling silent or to those who are voiceless in Poland or those who are being persecuted. That is the biggest, uh, th that, that is what the international community can say can, and can be our voice um, because that's what, you know, populists are afraid of. They're, they're okay with being left alone to do what they're bidding and their will. And don't leave them alone to do that. Don't leave them to do whatever they want to do. Because again, something that I always say, um, another one populist's plan is a blueprint for a different populist. And now we're, today we're talking about Poland. Tomorrow we may be talking about you know, Hungary. In a few days time, we may be talking about your country. You never know when it's going to hit you. And uh, what can feminists do? I think that feminists, especially knowing what it means to be discriminated, knowing what, what human rights mean, stand up for the, what those human rights mean, teach other people about what those human rights mean and their true meaning, not the one that is being forced on us by specific groups and, not, and do not allow for a redefinition of human rights. Okay. So thank you very much, Elisa. That's really great. That's very practical, uh, and uh, are, that's very practical uh, uh, suggestions, and uh, and it helps everyone keep a clear mind about what uh, what they can be doing for uh, in relation to Poland. I think we'll wrap up now, so we're exactly on time. So thank you so much. It's I, I can imagine it. Um, uh, it it's uh, you've been grilled now for half an hour after presenting the situation in your country. So thank you very much for making time to join us. Uh, thank you to everyone who's participated in this webinar. And just as a reminder, if uh, uh, this, this webinar will be made available on the, on the YouTube channel of the Heinrich Böll uh, Foundation European Union. And so I think everyone who's been, who uh, signed up for it will receive a link uh, to, to be able to view it uh, at your ease. And, um, and at least hopefully when you were suggesting that, uh, that uh, to give a platform to uh, advocates from Poland, I'm hoping we were able to contribute in our own modest way by inviting you to speak at, at this webinar. So thank you very much. And, and as we say in French, uh, uh, Elisa, bon courage, keep up the good fight and, uh, and we'll be in touch again uh, in, the, in the very near future. So thank you all and we'll wrap up for now. Thank you.